Hi, hello to everyone. My name is Julio Capo Jr. and I'm a history professor at Florida International University in Miami and the deputy director of the Wolfsonian Public Humanities Lab or the WPHL for short at FIU. And on behalf of the WPHL, co-presenter of today's talk with partners at the University of Massachusetts at Amherst, it is my delight to welcome you to today's important and ever so timely conversation, telling the truth about history. In no uncertain terms, the teaching of accurate history is under attack. It's also not the first time we see this in history. In fact, we have seen such efforts so often rooted in anti-Black sentiments in the telling and rewriting of national narratives, from the origins and the impact of the Civil War and the so-called lost cause, the Confederate monuments erected in the South and beyond to commemorate particular tellings of the past, the purging and removal of indigenous peoples and cultures in the telling of history, and of course, the retraining and re-education programs that went along with assimilation efforts of indigenous peoples, but also former enslaved people, immigrants, and others. And indeed, the erasure of Black racial, indigenous, ethnic, sexuality, and LGBTQ studies more broadly, just to name a few examples. It has, not only been, it has also not been uncommon for these efforts to have been framed as being done solely in the defense of children, from efforts to challenge racial integration in schools, for instance, to laws prohibiting discussions of gender and sexual identity and LGBTQ families. Of course, even the unequal access to resources from textbooks to technology that plague our education systems are a part of this story. The efforts to curb the telling of accurate history that we'll focus on for today's program have largely taken form through new legislation across the country. Since January of 2021, at least 41 states have introduced bills or taken concrete steps that would restrict the teaching or discussion of divisive concepts as far ranging and all encompassing as racism, sexism, sexual and gender identity, critical race theory, or more specific initiatives like the 1619 Project. Today's program is in conversation with scholars, political leaders, and teachers who are actively thinking about these issues and who are going to address the ongoing national assault against teaching accurate and evidence-based history at the K through 12 level and increasingly at the community college and university levels. These efforts impact us all in society. Our distinguished moderators, my dear friend and former colleague, or perhaps I'm gonna selfishly say forever colleague, Dr. Barbara Krauthammer. And it's my honor to introduce her briefly now. Dr. Krauthammer is Dean of the College of Humanities and Fine Arts and Professor of History at UMass Amherst. She is an award-winning historian of slavery and emancipation and a much sought out public intellectual and thinker. Her publications, awards, and accolades are extensive, but I'm gonna note one in particular among her many publications. She's co-author of Envisioning Emancipation, Black Americans and the End of Slavery, which received numerous honors, perhaps most notably the 2013 NAACP Image Award for Outstanding Literary Work in Nonfiction. Welcome, Dr. Dean Krauthammer. Hello, everybody. Thank you, Julio, forever colleague. I like that very much, so thank you. I am really delighted to have this chance to welcome everyone um, on behalf of the UMass Amherst History Department, which is the co-presenter of this event in collaboration with the Wolfsonian Public Humanities Lab at Florida International University. I'm also pleased to welcome you all on behalf of the College of Humanities and Fine Arts, which is a proud co-sponsor of this event, along with the College of Social and Behavioral Sciences and numerous departments, centers, and institutes from all across our campus. And so I invite everyone in the audience to please be sure to take a look at the chat feature where you'll be able to see a full list of the co-sponsors and links where you can learn more about each of them. Today, we'll have time at the end of the event for your questions, and you're all invited to submit questions through the link that will be available to you in the chat feature. I'll invite our speakers to respond to your questions when we come to the end of all of the presentations. This afternoon, we have a truly distinguished panel of speakers. I will give a brief introduction of each one of them, one at a time, before they each begin. And I'll invite each of you again to look in the chat box where you'll be able to see the full bios of each speaker. So we'll get right to it in respect of everyone's time and I know enthusiasm to hear from each of our speakers this afternoon. 
First today, we'll be joined by Florida State Senator Chevron Jones. Senator Jones was a former high school teacher and his firsthand look at inequities in education and society propelled him to enter public service. Jones is a nationally prominent leading voice against bills restricting how we teach about race, such as Florida, the Florida legislature's Stop the Woke Act, and the recently signed Florida law, which is popularly, I suppose, known as Don't Say Gay, which restricts the teaching about sexual orientation and gender identity. Jones is the first openly LGBTQ state senator in Florida's history. And just last week, I should add, President Biden appointed Senator Jones to serve on his board of advisors on HBCUs, historically black colleges and universities. And so it's my great pleasure now to welcome Senator Chevron Jones to UMass and FIU, even virtually. Senator Jones? Good evening, and thank you so much uh, for having me uh, to FIU and to, to UMass and for uh, convening uh, all of us uh, here uh, together for this very important conversation. Uh, one that I would uh, I would like to start off by saying that the fact that uh, we have to have this type of conversation in 2022 uh, is a problem within itself. Uh, regardless of what your politics might be, the one thing that we all should and can agree on uh, is that accurate and true history uh, should be taught. Uh, it's not uh, the just thing to do, it's the right thing to do. Uh, and the moment, the moment we become lackadaisical uh, about the truth, I believe we have lost our way. Uh, whether you're a Democrat, Republican, or just being a human being, period, we have lost our way when you become lackadaisical, when we become lackadaisical about that. Whether it's talking about Stonewall, uh, our LGBTQ community deserve for people to know the struggles, the victories, and the triumphs uh, that have got them to this place or to this point. Whether it's talking about the civil rights movement, uh, the Black community, they deserve for people to, to know uh, what happened and how uh, resilient we are, how much of people we are when it comes uh, to the place that we are in today. But when you look at the legislature and you see what's happening across the country, and the culture wars that are taking place, not just in Florida, but the culture wars that are taking place in Tennessee, in Texas, in Mississippi, in Alabama, in Georgia, and all these places, uh, it, it should bring great pause to each and every last one of us, because every one of us, regardless of where you come from, you have a history uh, that should be told, uh, because you all know the old saying that if you don't know your history, we're bound to repeat it. Uh, and the fear that I have is that we are uh, moving in a direction to where our young people um, not only will begin to question uh, the history, but I, I'm, I'm, I'm afraid uh, that looking at what's happening politically, uh, that we might can, we are on the brink of going back into places that we fought hard to come for, from. If you look at Senate Bill 148, which is known as the individual freedom, or the uh, my colleagues uh, cloaking as the uh, Stop the Wolf Act, uh, the title within itself, individual freedom, is only a guise uh, to work up people who are not familiar with the process. Uh, my colleagues, they cloak themselves in freedom, but they clearly they have picked and chose uh, which freedoms and for whom they support these said freedoms. You know, unfortunately, you know, my, my my colleagues on the other side of the who I have the pleasure of serving with, and, and some people might say, why is it such a pleasure? Um, because I don't fault you on your differences. Why I begin to uh, push back on you is when we start having these type of wars uh, with things that I know for a fact deep down, deep down inside that you yourself also know it's wrong. Uh, like, you know, good and well that CRT is not taught in our K-12 schools. Uh, and it's unfortunate that instead of running on forward looking ideas to improve people's daily lives like rent control or uh, like dealing with getting small businesses back up and running. Uh, my colleagues would rather manufacture a crisis across this country and within the state uh, out of a non-issue all in the hopes of fanning the flames of a culture war for political gain. And when it comes to the education of our children, I believe that every parent uh, wants the same basic thing. I believe you even want the, uh, the, the basic things. Uh, and that is to make sure you know the truth, you learn the truth, and making sure that the communities you live in uh, are safe. And I think we do our children a huge disservice by hiding, lying, or even covering up 
the truth, especially as we were tasked, as we are tasked with setting them up for long-term success. But how can we set them up for long-term success by not telling them the truth? Or how can we set them up for success by calling things for what it's not and dealing with things that we're dealing with Let's call it with the don't say gay bill. And you're you, you totally come against marginalized communities. Uh, it is this type of uh, denial of the systemic injustices of our country, spanning from economic to housing, to education, uh, to justice, to the environment, uh, would not help us build healthy or safer communities. Instead, it's up to all of us in this time, in this moment that we're in right now, to rise to the occasion, to build that future that we're looking for, and also to even push back on some of these type of policies that are coming across uh, this country. I don't know what your political background is. Now, I don't know what your stance is when it comes to how things look right now. But I will hope that the one thing that we all can agree on, that this is not the direction that we should be moving in. I think we, and I also hope that we all can agree that the country is moving in a totally different direction than we see what's happening right now. How do I know that? Because I see the pushback that's happening with our young people. I see, I saw them last week and how they came out in droves for the don't say gay bill to make it clear that this is not what we want because that's my family member, that's my friend, that's my mom, that's my dad. And I think that we, on these type of conversations, we have to learn that just not sitting on a panel or just not listening to a panel is what's going to change what happens. It's what we do after this panel is done. It's making sure that you raise your voices outside of this space to do what's right, fighting for those individuals who need your voice more than anything. If you're an ally, be that ally. But I ask that you change, as I close, I ask that you change the word allyship, whether it's for an ally for an LGBTQ friend or whether it's an ally for a Black, Hispanic, or even an Indigenous person or anyone who might be marginalized. Change the word ally to an accomplice. Become someone's accomplice in this moment that we're in right now. Why is that important? Because that means you're ready to ride or die for anybody in this moment. And I think this time is now for you to stand up to be a great accomplice for someone right now. Thank you all for having me. I'm looking forward to the conversation. I'm looking forward to hearing from you all and to see how we can continue to move this train forward. Thank you again for having me. Thank you, Senator Jones. I know you have to dash off very quickly. So if you have a minute, we got one question already that's for you. Um, so I'll ask you that question and then maybe you'll have a couple minutes to respond. Um, and I have the wrong glasses on for reading small print on my screen. Um, <laughs> the question is, what is the actual law in Florida? It seems to be closer to don't say anything about anybody, not just don't say gay. And then the second part of that question is what, or maybe it's the second question, sorry. What kind of teachers will agree to teach under these restrictions? I and think, so maybe that gets to your point about accomplices, which I liked very much. Yeah, I'm, I'm so happy you said that. And I, and I appreciate uh, the question. And I, I'll start at the top. Uh, you're right. Uh, I don't know if you all have seen, but there is a, a letter that has been generated by uh, a teacher uh, who who has made it clear that, you know what, then if uh, based off on the law, let me tell you what the law, what, what it says. The, the law that was just passed says that classroom instruction by school personnel or third parties on sexual orientation or gender identity may not occur in kindergarten through third grade. But here's the problem. Here's the point to where we uh, where uh, uh, is is what we fear that it includes all students. It says, or in a manner that is age appropriate or developmentally appropriate. In the letter that went around, made it clear that, you know what, if you're talking about sexual orientation and gender identity, that means that we can't tell children the difference between Mr. and Miss. That means we need to take boys' bathroom and girls' bath, uh, bath bathroom signs off of the doors. Uh, that means that uh, we, we, we can't refer, refer to students as she or he. Uh, and so there's a lot of things that have that are occurring to where teachers are actually pushing back. Uh, I saw a teacher just made mention that this is the hill that she, he's willing to die on because he's been in this profession for over 30 years. And no one will ever know the, amount, the type of students who have come to share their stories with them. And I say the same thing for myself when I was teaching uh, for, for 10 years. And the, the, my, the students who came and shared things that they could never go and share with their, with their parents. Uh, and knowing that many of these children come from different type of households, whether it's a foster uh, parent, 
uh, whether it's an adoptive parent. And we just don't know what type of household. So that's why this type of things are dangerous uh, on its surface. And so, yes, you're right. Uh, it does limit uh, any type of conversation on sexual orientation or gender identity based on how the law is written at right now. Thank you. And if you have time, I have one more question. Go ahead. Yeah, absolutely. I'm good. Okay, great. Um, the question is, in what ways can we use concepts like compassion and dignity to call in rather than call out yes. those who are invested in these issues? That is my favorite word. Uh, the, I, I, I'm, 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 I'm here for always in using the, the term, uh, how can we call people in rather than call people out? And it's 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 it has to start at the it has to start at the uh, the leadership level because th those are the individuals who are setting the tone right now. The tone what we're seeing right now is on this, uh, is is on the um, on, on these culture wars, and I don't and that's why I don't know if anyone um, have, have pay attention to what's happening uh, of like the Florida channel, which I don't know who does, but uh, but in in my debate. Uh, as sharing why I shared my story when we were talking about uh, the parental rights and education, which colloquially we now call the uh, don't say gay bill. Um, I shared my story because as a black gay man and the first openly gay person to be elected to the floor of Senate, you got like two, I got, not like, I have two things going against me right now. I have to fight the culture war of race and I have to fight the culture war of my sexuality. But the reason I wanted to share my story because all my colleagues, they were speaking from this place, this hypothetical place. I'm like, wait, let's not speak in hypotheticals. I'm sitting right here in this room with you. So let me tell you my story. And so even I was able to win over three of my Republican colleagues based off of my story. And I think the only way we're going, we, we put that compassion, that love for everyone in the hands of the people who are making these rules and laws. I think we have to, Make sure that we start telling our stories. Make it real for them. We have a member in the Florida Senate who has a, a, a transgender daughter. I have a, one of the other members of the legislature or in the Senate who has who has a son who's gay. You have to bring this stuff back home to them so they know that this is wrong on the surface. Thank you. And then one more, if you can stay with us. Go ahead. We're good. We're good. Okay. Okay. <laughs> you just give me the sign when when you got to jump off. Deal. Um, Okay, so this is a question that comes from a UMass Amherst class of students who are all interested in becoming history teachers. And so they ask, what strategies do you recommend for new teachers who are just entering the classroom and will be teaching the hard histories of class, race, gender, and identity? First, I want to tell you thank you for wanting to, wanting to go in to, to, into the teaching profession because the the, pipe, the pipeline, is, uh, pipeline is slim pickings right now uh, because of a lot of this what we're seeing that, uh, across the board. Uh, when it comes to teaching history and, and, and teaching it, the accuracy of it, teach the history. Don't, you, you, I, 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 there's no other way that I can tell you that telling the truth is the only way to go. They can't fault you for telling the truth. They just can't. The truth of the truth, history happened. Lynching happened. Uh, uh, redlining happened. That's not no. That's not. That's those are all facts. It's in the books. Regardless of how they write that type of stuff in our textbooks, it's actual facts. Now they want to fire you based off of the facts. So be it. Die on that hill. But when you die on that hill, make it clear that you know what. If you're gonna fire me, you're gonna fire me because I did the right thing, and be okay with that. I love that. How do y'all go out and lose your job? <laughs> what I am telling you is to tell the truth. <laughs> I, I, I love that. Well, it is one of the great things about studying history, right? It's like the fact we have the evidence, right? right. We have the photographs, we have the documents, we have the oral histories, we ha right? We have that material. And so to be able to share that and teach that material um, really is, is a mission and a calling. Mm -hmm. um, okay. So I'm getting the, the sign that says we have just a couple minutes left. Okay. But so one more person wanted to ask, what is the impact of the Stop the Woke Act being tied to state performance funding? That's a very good question. Um, so for those of you who don't know, the state, uh, the uh, the way the state of Florida has has done with uh, performance funding over the years. Uh, has been this huge ebb and flow uh, within our educational system right now. Uh, I do know 
after speaking with the bill sponsor when it came to uh, uh, tying the stop the vote at to the uh, performance based funding, um, that was a portion of the bill that will not be enacted at this time. And I doubt that they will enact it at all because there's no way you're going to be able to tie it to um, to to uh, performance based funding unless you're going to have cameras put inside the classroom to see whether or not a teacher is actually. Uh, doing that or not. So uh, to my understanding, based off of the, uh, based from the information from the bill sponsor, it's something that they are not, uh, they don't believe is going to be able to be um, enforced. And I'm in, in, in Florida and me being in the, in the legislature for the last 11 years, I'm going to say at this time. Excellent. Well, Senator Jones, thank you so much for making time for us. Um, I can only imagine that you're, you know, running off to Zoom with Vice President Harris or something. Uh, <laughs> <He's so funny. laughs> I'm, I'm a little bit jealous, but that's- No, I won't do that. <laughs> um, but really, we're, we're really so grateful to you for making the time um, to drop in and be a part of this panel. Um, really and hopefully appreciate. we'll have more opportunities in the future. I really appreciate you for having me. And if anyone wants to contact me or you want to continue the conversation, you can email me at my first and last name at gmail.com and we can set something up. Lovely. Thank you so much. Deal. All right, folks. Our next speaker will be Professor Laura Briggs. And so now we will shift to the actual format where we will hear from the rest of the speakers and then we'll do the full question and answer and conversation at the end. We had to deviate um, to accommodate the Senator's schedule. Um, so Professor Laura Briggs is Professor of Women, Gender, Sexuality Studies at UMass Amherst and a member of the Organization of American Historians Academic Freedom Committee, where she has been active in monitoring and responding to educational gag orders. She brings to this conversation dual expertise as a historian of race, gender, and of attempts to ban the teaching of critical histories, as well as on the ground experience from her work fighting for ethnic studies in the state of Arizona. So I'll turn things over now to Professor Laura Briggs. Thank you very much. I'm so sorry that um, <clears throat> State Legislator Jones had to go. That was really interesting. So I'm gonna put up a PowerPoint because I think it's a little bit easier um, on Zoom to watch PowerPoint. Um, so as we know, many, many states are passing laws against what are called device, what they're calling divisive concepts or critical race theory. Um, it's not in fact critical race theory that they're talking about. Um, as we know, critical race theory is taught in law schools. Um, but the, the desire to call it critical race theory is specifically about um, a conservative activist named Christopher Rufo, who, um, who took this term from law schools and thought that it would be, um, that it could be weaponized for um, culture wars. It, um, emerged in 2020 in response to fights in K-12 over how to think about the mass demonstrations in the summer of 2020 against police violence and anti-Blackness. And if you were part of a school community or even just watching Twitter the following February, um, there were fights in all sorts of schools, especially in the South, um, about how to about how to respond to the fight over how to respond to um, Black History Month. At the same time, there were um, bills for Asian American and Pacific Islander curriculum in 2020 um, after the after surging hate crimes in response to the pandemic and the. Trump administration's reference to it as the um, as the China virus, and after the murders in Atlanta. Um, so, what Christopher Rufo and other conservative activists sought to do was really turn the conversation away from education as a tool to fight against hate, to fight against um, police violence, 
and to reframe it as something that made white kids feel bad um, or something that created division. And this is a long history. Um, we could pick any decade in the last century and talk about fights over school curriculum and fights over public schools in particular. Um, Milton Friedman wrote a paper in 1955 arguing that government schools are socialism, inaugurating a particular recent conservative fight to privatize public schools um, through the charter school movement. But this has roots in fights over school desegregation in the 1950s through the 70s, white parents pulling their kids out and placing them in what um, many people called segregation academies to keep white kids from going to school with black kids. Uh, we could also point to the Reconstruction era, the 1870s, and the, the very founding of public schools in the South was the result of work by, um, by Black activists, by the former abolitionists calling for the presence of public schools. And um, former slavers called those um, socialism, they also, and this seems relevant, um, called them amalgamationism with a referen referencing um, interracial, interracial relationships. So the wedding together of race and sexuality has a century long history that we see turning up in things like the twinning of the bills in Florida, the um, don't say gay bill, and the anti-woke bills. The fact that there are bills in 41 states is the result of an organized campaign on the political right. Um, ALEC, the American Legislative Exchange Council, is one of the uh, organizations promoting these kinds of bills. And they're a conservative organization that hands out model legislation to um, Republican lawmakers in state legislatures. But um, they held a workshop that reads like a who's who of conservative think tanks, the Heritage Foundation, the Woodson Center, the American Enterprise Institute, <clears throat> Discovery Institute and um, ALEC itself. So in each iteration of these statewide fights, we see, um, we see the, they're changing a little bit. One of the most recent um, trial balloons before this current wave, this 2021, wave of bills to create controversy around public schools um, was a trial balloon in Tucson, Arizona um, between 2008 and 2010 um, over ethnic studies in Tucson public schools, which was supported by the University of Arizona in um, Mexican American studies, social and behavioral sciences, and what they found was that there was a 100% graduation rate for kids who had experience in ethnic studies classes. They were wildly successful in building kids' investment in their own education, in graduating, in feeling like the schools were relevant to them, high school was relevant to them. And this is in the context of a 50% graduate graduation rate for Mexican-American kids in general in Tucson. So there was a right-wing effort to stop it. It was part of the broader set of anti-immigration efforts that were being tried out. Um, Arizona being relatively uh, sparsely populated has been a place where um, conservative activists from all over the country have tried to have tried out many different kinds of political campaigns. And what happened in Tucson was that people who supported the work in ethnic studies 
we built really powerful coalitions in support of ethnic studies. And this effort to ban it failed at the level of the Tucson Public Schools. Um, it was largely an effort inaugurated in, to, in Phoenix um, and directed at the um, directed at Southern Arizona and tribal nations, the black community, academic freedom, progressive people uh, um, supported ethnic studies. It became a national campaign and part of the national boycott of Arizona in relationship to immigration bills. And so it actually took until um, conservatives held the governor's office before they were able to, in fact, defund ethnic studies in Arizona. Um, similarly, I'm going to talk a little bit about Texas because I think other people will talk about the Southeast. I want to just nod to the Southwest. Um, what conservatives learn, learned, I think, from the Tucson efforts is that efforts focused on race exclusively didn't work very well. And this is why they've been increasingly linked to focus on sexuality, gender, and indigeneity as much as anti-Blackness and race. So the Texas law didn't just eliminate the teaching of Black history. It also eliminated the teaching of Native history, women's suffrage. It banned um, books in libraries with lesbian, gay, bisexual, and trans content. Also, anything to do with abortion or the reproductive system. Um, and of course, there we've heard administrators calling for teaching of both sides of the Holocaust or the KKK. And Texas and other places in the Southwest, like Oklahoma, that have been perhaps mo most broadly under attack have built strong coalitions um, and filed lawsuits based on First Amendment jurisprudence related to academic freedom. Lawsuits they have, um, and K-12 and university faculty have worked together to, um, to, fight, to fight against these laws. It's important to recognize that um, they are currently in court. And finally, this past weekend, um, the Organization of American Historians called these laws an existential threat to US historians and to the teaching of history. Um, one of the reasons you could say that that's kind of funny is that we see here in the Virginia law that was filed um, blatant inaccuracies where for example, claiming that Abraham Lincoln, instead of debating um, Senator Stephen Douglas, um, debated Frederick Douglas. And what this is about, of course, is that people who aren't historians are trying to dictate specifically what kind of historical content is going to be taught. But it doesn't matter whether you do this kind of history specifically or not. Um, once legislators and um, polit political folks are making the teaching of history into itself a culture wars issue, then, um, then none of us are safe. It means that any kind of history is available for this kind of politicization. And of course, there's a long history of the politicization of history and um, related scholarly fields. This effort in the United States is part of an international movement on the political right from Eastern European or Eastern European states, um, specifically Poland and Hungary, um, which have banned the teaching of gender ideology um, in schools. And um, 
to fights in India over the nature of the teaching of Hindu history, in Japan about the, the teaching of what the Imperial Army of Japan did in Korea, whether it actually forced women into um, sex work. And throughout Latin America, we've seen um, the proliferation of this hashtag, con mis hijos no te metas, um, don't mess with my kids, which should sound very familiar to us. And in fact, it is um, content from Latin America is showing up in right wing Facebook pages here in the US, um, as well as <clears throat> this kind of gender ideology content, which is anti trans anti feminist. Um, it's the claim that words that progressive people are saying that gender doesn't matter that children can change their gender at will. We saw it last week in Ted Cruz asking um, Katanji Brown Jackson, can you say what a woman is? This um, content is being widely shared across diverse countries and an entwined um, international right. All right, I'll stop there. Great, thank you so much, Professor Briggs. Our next speaker is Professor Raphael Rogers. Let me pull up my right notes here, sorry about that. Um, professor Rogers is a professor and teacher educator at Clark University and received his doctorate in education from UMass Amherst. Prior to that, Professor Rogers was a longtime secondary level history teacher right here in Amherst and throughout the state. Professor Rogers' work focuses on racism in K through 12 education and on representations of blackness in children's literature. And he has collaborated with other Massachusetts educators to create culturally responsive teaching resources for the state's Department of Education. So I'll now turn things over to Professor Raphael Rogers. Thank you. It's great to be here today. I hope that my brief sharing is informative, particularly for the aspiring history teachers who are in attendance. Much of what I'll share today is much about the practice of teaching history. As a teacher educator who works and supports history teachers in Massachusetts at various levels of their career, every year I'm engaged in a process of considering various aspects of the complex issues that are being discussed here today. Because I've written about teaching and learning about slavery, spend time each year in several secondary level classrooms, teaching about the institution, and provide professional development session that focuses on, the ta ta on tackling the complex task of teaching the history of slavery, reconstruction, and civil rights. I can say that I'm not surprised that a growing number of states have legislative bills on the books that seek to prohibit teachers from engaging with their students in the study of what they are calling divisive concepts or difficult topics. So while some might be, I am not surprised that a bill was introduced in West Virginia early this year that sought to prevent educators from teaching that individuals are oppressors because they're, they're of their race. I am not surprised that last year, states like Alaska, Michigan, Missouri, and nearby New York, Rhode Island, and Washington had bills on the books that stop, sought to stop teachers from using the 1619 project materials in their classroom. I am also not surprised that last year, multiple states, seven, there were bills introduced that explicitly have called for a ban on the teaching of the divisive concepts. I'm also not surprised by these, I am not surprised by these bills because the how, the why, and the if we teach the history of slavery, reconstruction, and the civil rights movement have long been debated and led to much, con led to much controversy among various stakeholders for decades in this country. 
It is because of bills like those, the ones that I referenced above, and ongoing debates that the following emotions are prominent when I work with teachers focused on how to teach slavery in their classes in Massachusetts. Nervous, concerned, confused, worried, wary, unprepared. This is how middle and high school teachers have told me they have felt over the past few years when it comes to teaching the troublesome topic of slavery. Although I work with teachers in Massachusetts, their reaction to the teaching of slavery is quite common among teachers throughout the United States. Fortunately, in recent years, there have been a growing number of individuals who have weighed in with some useful advice. Some such as history professor Hassan Kwame Jeffries and Kenneth Greenberg have advocated for helping students to see the ways in which enslaved people fought back against the brutality of slavery. Whether through a focus on the fight to maintain family and culture, resistance at work, running away, physical confrontation or revolt, students get a deeper understanding of slavery when the lessons include various ways that enslaved people courageously fought against their bondage. Others, like the author of the book, The Lies My Teacher Told Me, have argued for a focus on how slavery deeply influenced our popular culture through movies, television series, historical fiction, and music. There are also others who have recommended the use of specific resources and curriculum materials like the Harriet Jacob Papers Project, the four-part documentary series, Africans in America, and the Freedom on the Move database, which features thousands of runaway slave advertisements. Heeding some of these recommendations in my work with teachers, we have sought to come up with lessons that students like Alani Rivas, a junior at Claremont Academy in Worcester, Massachusetts, say have helped them to become more informed and educated about history. These lessons that I have developed take a variety of approaches, but all are rooted in taking a look at the realities of slavery using historical evidence. Many students have echoed Alani's feedback that I've collected from several classes that I've helped to design lessons for. And the teachers whom I work with have all shared informally that they are now confident in taking on the challenge of teaching the complex history of slavery and other complex topics that they are charged with covering throughout the school year. Much of this confidence, in my opinion, is due to four things that I believe are really important for any teacher who plans to teach about the slavery of institution or other hard topics that teachers are charged with covering with their students. One, explore the actual records. Few things shine through the light of the harsh realities of slavery like historical documents. I'm talking about things like plantation records, slave diaries, and letters penned by plantation owners and mistresses. It also pays to examine wanted advertisement for runaway slaves. These ads provided details about those who managed to escape slavery. In some cases, the ads contain drawings, these materials can help teachers guide students to better understand the historical context in which slavery existed. Educators may also wish to look at how people such as historian Cynthia Lynn Learley, who wrote a chapter Understanding and Teaching American Slavery, have used historical documents to teach about the institution. Two, examine historical, historical arguments in order to better understand different perspectives about slavery and other historical topics, it pays to examine historical arguments about how slavery developed, expanded, and ended. Students can read texts that were written by abolitionists like Frederick Douglass and pro-slavery advocates. They should wade through newspaper advertisements that provide details about those who managed to escape slavery. 
Looking at different arguments will show students that history is filled with disagreement, debate, and interpretations based on different goals. For instance, in examining arguments about slavery, teachers can show students how early 20th century historians like Ulrich Phillips sought to put forth ideas about kind masters and contented slaves, while others from the 90s, such as John Hope Franklin, co-author co of Runaway Slaves, Rebels on the Plantation, focused on how Black people resisted slavery. Seeing these starkly different portrayals of slavery gives students a chance to examine how things such as choice, context, racism, and bias might affect the way slavery is seen or viewed. Three, highlight lived experiences. In my 11 years of teaching history, many students entered my classes with a great deal of misinformation about what life was like for those who lived under, sla under slavery. In pre-unit surveys, some stated that enslaved people worked only in cotton fields and were not treated that badly. We know that the historical records tell a different story. While many worked as field hands, there were others who were put into service in various ways. To combat misconceptions like this, I advise teachers to use historical sources that feature details about the lived experiences of enslaved people. For instance, Teachers should have students read Harriet J. Kipp's memoir alongside diaries by white plantation owners. They should scrutinize photographs of slave quarters and excerpts from the, the WPA narrative, which contains more than 2,300 first person accounts of slavery. Ask students to examine various historical sources to gain a better understanding of how people live through their bondage over time. Four, consider the relevance. It is also crucial for teachers to consider the various ways in which slavery is relevant to the present with their students. I advise them to ask questions like, how was the history of slavery influenced the status of black people in the United States today? Why are there so many movies about slavery? In Ailani's class, we ended our unit by providing students with a chance to read and think about the relevance of recent picture books about slavery, like Patricia Polacco's January Sparrow and, Turner and, James and, and Turner's My Name is Truth, The Life of Sojourner Truth, and Jordana Haggard's The Slave Who Went to Congress. We asked students to draw on what they had learned about slavery, to consider and then share their perspectives about historical accuracy, classroom appropriateness, and the relevance of selected picture books, of a selected picture book. Students have all, always have much to say about three, about all three. And five, connect and inform parents and guardians about your approach and goals when you can. To conclude, I think it's really important to consider history class as a place where students can engage in doing the critical work that historians do. This work can help to help much in helping students to become thoughtful citizens and engage in a process of considering all the information and perspectives, historical or not, that they are bombarded with daily. Thank you, Professor Rogers. We'll now turn to Professor Jennifer Rich. Professor Jennifer Rich is Executive Director of the Center for the Study of the Holocaust, Genocide, and Human Rights, and Director of the Masters of, Masters of Arts in Holocaust and Genocide Education, and Associate Professor in the Department of Sociology and Anthropology at Rowan University. Professor Rich's research focuses on best practices in Holocaust and genocide education, the teaching of hard histories, and the memory of the Holocaust and other genocides in culture, education, 
and by the children and grandchildren of the survivors of genocides. So Professor Rich. Thank you so much. Um, so anti-Semitism comes up in the news um, every so often, right? We most recently, of course, there was the banning of the book Mouse by Art Spiegelman in Tennessee, which um, had an unintended and positive side effect of boosting book sales and building lots of conversation around a book that um, is pretty wonderful. Um, of course, there was the uh, both sides teaching opposing views of the Holocaust um, in Texas that Professor Briggs mentioned earlier. We heard recently about third grade students in DC asked to reenact scenes from the Holocaust. Um, and then there's the violence um, that occurs that is rooted in anti-Semitism. Um, thinking a couple years back, of course, to the Pittsburgh shooting at the Tree of Life Synagogue, and most recently, the hostages that were taken in Texas. Um, and anti-Semitism, I've been thinking about how I want to frame what I'm going to share this, this evening. Um, anti-Semitism, of course, comes up when we talk about the Holocaust. Um, we see anti-Semitism when we think about how people teach, teachers teach about the Holocaust, um, often unintentionally, um, perhaps, un, you know, sort of reinforcing beliefs. Um, I always ask students in my classes how they first learned about the Holocaust. And I teach in New Jersey, which was the first state in the United States that had a Holocaust education mandate. And all of the students that I have now grew up since the mandate was passed in 1994. And um, almost all of my students went to public school in New Jersey. And they often say that they learned about the Holocaust by reading or watching The Boy in the Striped Pajamas. Um, and sometimes they have stories of projects that they, that they were asked to complete growing up. Um, I had a student who had to make a Nazi cereal box. Um, another who had to build an ideal concentration camp out of popsicle sticks. Um, so not a replica, but ideal, which leaves a lot sort of open in terms of what does that mean? Um, but one of the things that I talk a lot about with my students is the fact that anti-Semitism is something that we hear and see so often sort of in the air. Um, we hear jokes all the, often um, about Jewish stereotypes. Jews are greedy, money hungry. Um, we, there are often in the media in particular now, um, there are the same tropes about Jews controlling things from the economy to politics to the media. Um, the weather and space lasers um, were a topic of conversation for, for a while. Um, there are, of course, the current debates about Israel and Palestine. And there we get into thinking about um, anti-Semitism on the left and on the right. There is Holocaust denial and distortion. Um, I had a very lovely student who is now a, um, an early childhood teacher in New Jersey who came to me one day after class and said that she was having a hard time because she grew up in a family and going to a, a church where she was taught that the Jews killed Jesus and the Holocaust was um, sort of what, what the Jews deserved. And she was struggling in terms of how to sort of balance that with the fact that I was her teacher and I am Jewish and she liked me. Um, she didn't know how to sort of balance these two things. And she's one of many students who have asked about this idea of didn't the Jews kill Jesus? Um, I've had students who have pushed back against the number six million Jews were murdered um, during the Holocaust saying that we can't really know what happened in 
gas chambers. Um, how do we know this number? How do we know this happened? Um, and all of these sort of broad examples, right? The Holocaust distortion denial, the sort of Jewish jokes um, in a high school nearby where I live, um, there are very few Jewish kids in the school. And when they walk down the hall, um, people throw change in front of them. Um, and these are their, their friends. They're joking in between friends and the kids um, have learned to sort of laugh it off and not to make a big deal out of it. And I think that what matters um, is the, I think we all need to start um, sort of acknowledging the fact that anti-Semitism is baked in, um, baked into our culture, into American sort of conversation in the same way that racism is or um, homophobia. And all of these have the same sort of underpinning of um, bias, prejudice, intolerance, the consequences of stereotypes. Um, and ultimately, I think the first way that we start to make change is to examine our own biases, our prejudices. Um, we've talked about this as a as a country a lot when we've been talking about race lately. And I think that that is um, so important and work that it needs to go on really um, forever. Um, I think that we do a little bit less examining of biases around religion. Um, sometimes we think about our own biases, um, you know, when Islamophobia rears its head or anti-Semitism, and it becomes easy, I think, to um, to believe I'm not anti-Semitic because I wouldn't become a Nazi. Um, I wouldn't, and that's part of what we teach kids in school. Um, when we do teach about the Holocaust and we talk to kids about um, you need to stick up for your friends on the playground. You need to be an upstander. And if you can be an upstander for your friends, you would be able to um, be a helper during genocide. And it's well-intentioned, of course, when teachers um, think about that, but it's there's no equivalent, right? Um, it's important to stand up for your friends, of course, but it's not the same it's not the same, period. Um, so helping young people and not so young people develop an understanding of what Judaism is and what it isn't is also really important. Um, Judaism is not only about the Holocaust um, and it is, uh, if you ask, lots of people what it means to be Jewish, you'll get lots of different answers. Um, I would define it as a, a religion, a culture and a shared history. Um, I would not describe being Jewish as a race. Um, though my students have debated this with me because of um, 23andMe tests. You can see that if a person is Ashkenazi Jewish um, and they, they can't quite understand how that happened. So there are lots of um, questions that come up, but helping people understand um, that Judaism is not about this moment in time. It's not about the Holocaust. Um, and Jewish people are sort of all around us. I have students in New Jersey who believe that they've never met a Jewish person until they meet me in class. And New Jersey is a state in this country that um, has one of the higher Jewish populations. I think um, I'll end by just sort of addressing specifically that class that asked a question earlier of pre-service teachers um, and say that I think it's really hard to be a pre-tenure public school teacher right now. Um, I, I feel for all of you and I'm grateful for all of you for doing the work that you want to do. Um, and 
I think that um, the best advice I've shared with students and, and will share now um, is when you hear a comment that strikes you as anti-Semitic or racist, homophobic, misogynistic, et cetera, um, you want to, if you can, first and foremost, of course, protect the student who may feel attacked, um, but ask the student who made the comment, how do they know what they know? Where did they hear this, right? Before there's um, an angry response, think about what this student may have taken in um, and be repeating back without really understanding um, the ways in which that it might be hurtful. I'm going to stop there because I know I am very excited to get to the question and answer with everybody else on the panel. So thank you all and I will turn it back over. Great, thank you, Professor Rich. Um, so let me take this moment to remind everybody that you can still submit your questions, please, through the uh, link. The link was just posted again in the chat. So if you look in the chat function, you can find the link where you can submit questions um, and then we'll forward them to the group to discuss. But right now, a couple of questions have already been coming in. Um, and I think this is something, I don't know if we have the technology, maybe we do to get all of our panelists on, because I think um, this is a question that probably everyone might want to jump on, is how can we engage parents around these issues? And related to that, how, how would you suggest responding to parents who don't want their children to be taught hard material, things like the Holocaust, genocide, slavery, LGBTQ, gender identity? Um, so maybe, you know, even thinking back to um, Senator Jones's um, idea of coming up with accomplices, how do you enlist parents as accomplices and how do you respond to those um, who do not want to be accomplices? I, I will leave it to you. I don't know, Professor Rich, do you wanna jump in and then we can see what the others have to say as well? Sure, absolutely. Um, it's such a good question, and um, I'm going to give an answer that will probably be not terribly satisfying, um, which is to say that um, as a blanket statement, a blanket response, I think part of that has to do with understanding the context of a given school and its community and understanding where we as educators um, can start to make inroads with families, where we can find points of agreement, um, where we're gonna need to bring them into conversations that feel a little bit harder. Um, in the past year, I've had more teachers than ever reach out saying that they need to send home permission slips before they teach about the Holocaust. Um, and they're sort of terrified by that and the number of parents that then opt out of their children learning about the Holocaust or other genocides. Um, and I think that the place to start is in relationship building, um, starting, like I said, to find points of agreement and bringing parents into the fold that way to um, hopefully ultimately become accomplices. Um, but, you know, I, I think there might be a step there of, um, being open-minded before you get a full throttled in endorsement, even though that is where you want to go. Um, but I will let um, the, my other co-panelists um, share their response because I know this is a rich sort of meaty question. Great, Professor Rogers, you want to yeah. take a start? Yeah, well, the opt-out question, like in Massachusetts, Fortunately, teachers are backed by curriculum standards and framework. So I usually recommend to the teachers that I work with to inform parents about what teachers are being asked to do. They're being asked to tackle those challenging topics with their students. So in this state, those things are required. 
Um, but beyond like teaching those topics or histories, I, I think it's always great to reach out to parents and guardians periodically throughout the school year and share your approach and your goals. I think parents can be great allies. And I do think the folks that I've worked with in centering, like your child is doing the work that historians do. That work is really important in helping your child to be a real cri a, a critical thinker. I think usually that argument holds a lot of weight with a lot of parents and guardians in the state. So uh, opting out, you're backed by frameworks in this state. Um, and in terms of advice, parents and guardians can be great allies. So thank you. I want to confess my, um, my how inadequate I am to answer this question because I finished my um, high school social studies training in the 1980s and then didn't do it because we were at um, a kind of high watermark for, or, or maybe on the ebb side of an anti-gay panic. And I felt very uncomfortable as a student teacher in Cambridge, Mass, as somebody who looked like a lesbian, somebody who talked like a lesbian. And I felt like I was sort of endlessly like a screen for all of people's feelings about it. Um, but so I opted out and decided to go teach college with some sadness actually about it all. Um, so the students I get are volunteers in a much more profound way. But having said, I'm not qualified to answer and I'm gonna have an opinion anyway, cause I do that, um, which is we don't invite um, kids to opt out of math. And the precisely what we're being asked to do is to agree that history is controversial. Um, we don't all need history. We don't know what it's for. It's a way to make white kids feel bad. And I really think that we should reject that premise. Um, <clears throat> I want to support Raphael Rogers and say, um, you know, our school standards say this for a reason, and it's really important that um, professional associations support the K-12 curriculum um, standards that say history is important. Thank you all. Um, we have another question that I feel like is a little bit also of a comment that I want to acknowledge before we move on to other questions. And the question is, um, why have, has this panel not addressed um, Na Native American issues and why did we not include a Native American scholar on the panel? Um, and the way that I would like to address this um, is actually by acknowledging what we failed to do at the start of this event which was um, read the UMass land acknowledgement. And even though we are on Zoom, um, we generally do read through the UMass land acknowledgement, um, which begins, and I, I'll just read the short um, introduction to it and then maybe ask if the producers behind the scenes could put the link to the UMass land acknowledgement in the chat for everybody. But the University of Massachusetts Amherst acknowledges that it was founded and built on the unceded homelands of the Pocumtuck Nation on the land of the Norotuck community. And that we express our gratitude for nearby waters and lands. Um, and we recognize that the lands and waters in our region are important um, and relations with which we're all interconnected and depend on to sustain life and well being. And so I apologize for that oversight. That was really a failing on my part. And um, I do acknowledge that and want to apologize for that. And hopefully we can get that link up to the land acknowledgement in the chat. Um, the next question, um, although maybe folks, I don't know if you want to address um, the question part of that, which was there was no conversation about Native American issues. Laura, were you raising your hand for that? Yeah, I was just gonna say, I think the question is really important. 
And when whatever I'm teaching, I start by teaching um, the history of Native people in this place. And I start by teaching slavery and settler colonialism, no matter what, it, what the other subject is. If we're talking about reproductive politics, that's where we start. And um, so I just want to say I agree that that is critical and fundamental. And I was, um, tr and I'm still trying to think, I mean, the ways that Native history is excluded is not at this point, particularly with the exception of Texas, which is not a small exception, by being specifically targeted, but more broadly by being overlooked in general. Um, I think that there are far too few historians of settler colonialism and indigeneity um, working in public schools, in any, um, in any history department in the US or in Massachusetts. Thanks, and I'll jump in and maybe Professor Rogers has something to say about this as well, but you know, certainly what we also know from the research and all the documents, Professor Rogers, that you alluded to speak very clearly to the intertwined histories, right, of um, settler colonialism, genocide in the context of Native Americans and enslavement of Africans and African Americans. Um, throughout both the southern United the Southern colonies, the Southern United States, um, and into the Caribbean colonies um, as well. So there certainly are intertwined histories that I think um, absolutely we need to acknowledge um, in tandem. I'll say um, it's too bad we didn't have more time, but as a teacher educator working with aspiring history teachers, that experience, that history is on the table. Similar to slavery, controversies emerge. There's not enough sort of focused on highlighting the lived experiences of native folks in this state. Um, I think sometimes the students that I work with, they don't have that background. They don't know where they can, or training. They struggle with finding materials to utilize in their class. Um, they water down the history that they're charged with teaching. But it's part of my work to push them to try to imp implement the framework that I talked about here. So yes, I talked about slavery in this session, but my years are filled with grappling with how to teach many histories more effectively. Thank you. Um, we can also come back to this. There have been multiple requests for book recommendations. Um, so I don't know, I am bad at talking and typing in the chat, but maybe while we're taking turns type, talking, if you all have book recommendations that you want to share in the chat, um, we can get those posted. Um, another question has come in that says, let's see, the history truth tellers right now seem to be on the defensive fielding legislation and attacks from enemies of social justice. And so the question is, how can we move on to the offensive in proactively crafting policy and activism that anticipates these attacks in ideas and public education rather than responding? So I don't know if someone wants to jump in on that. I do think folks have anticipated attacks. And in thinking about this state again, where I do my work, if you look at the history frameworks, there's some guiding principles. And the guiding principles really focus on not necessarily like what is the truth, but they're trying to push teachers to get students to examine the historical past and think about what that examination means for their sort of perspective about history on their terms. So it's not like back in the day where the teacher was the only voice or the text was the only voice that wove its way into the classroom. I think lots of folks are trying to push for young people to engage with the historical record, to think about what it means to their lives, their context, 
and to think about the impact of histories on their lives. So I think the anticipation in this state was much about, yes, the content matters, but we wanna give you some advice about the framing in your classroom when it comes to teaching history. So for parents that want to push back or opt out, again, it's like we're having students look at the historical record. We're having them think about their own perspectives about X. And I think that helps some teachers. Um, and it makes them somewhat, the folks that I work with, a little more comfortable in saying like, here's the framework that we're employing. It's supported by the state. So, and I appreciate what it's doing for my students. So I think there has been some anticipation. That being said, if you look at other states in terms of what's going on with these bills um, and folks sort of dancing away from critical race theory matters, I think I'm a little concerned because um, I think it seems like there's an uptick in folks trying to control the content the approach in history classrooms across the nation. Thank you. That's actually the perfect segue to another question, which maybe then you, um, Professors Rich and Briggs, you can both sort of tag team on these two questions. And the second question is, or the next question was, why is this legislation so popular? What are parents looking for by controlling the way schools interact with their children? With their children. Um, so Professor Rich, I think I was about to cut you off right there. I was going to give a sort of one word answer to um, what can we do that, which is, um, I think we can vote and encourage people to, to vote, right? When we're talking about changing policy, um, I think that's a really big issue. And um, again, sort of thinking about what it's like to be particularly a new teacher in a public school. And I agree with everything that professors Briggs and Rogers have said about um, a mandate is a mandate, a framework, a curriculum. Um, and I also know that it can be really hard when you have a parent coming at you and you have a principal who may or may not be supportive of what you're doing. Um, and I think, in states that don't have um, necessarily the same sort of mandate or framework curriculum that um, some states, particularly in the Northeast, have, I think you know it, voting for the people who share your beliefs and values is really like one of the first things that we can do. Um, I might have shifted the topic back around, so let me pause um, and see if somebody else wants to jump in, but I think that's um, the easy and really hard answer. I want to suggest that maybe these bills aren't as popular as we think they are. Um, they are, so there was a really interesting study, and now I'm not going to be able to cite it, maybe it was CBS. Um, that asked people, how do you feel about the teaching of critical race theory in K-12? And lots of people said they were against it, um, 40, 50%. And the, um, the origin of the people's sense that they're against critical race theory actually has a lot to do with mainline Protestant, uh, um, evangelical Protestantism, not mainline Protestantism. The Southern Baptist Convention was lobbying heavily against it. Um, but if you ask people, what do they think about banning books? 80% of them say they're against it. If you ask people, what do they think, what do you think about um, teaching histories of racial groups that are not white? 80% say they're for it and that it, and that it does important things for white kids to develop empathy, to develop um, a sense of things beyond them. So I think that when people on the political right um, are successful filling the airwaves like on Fox News or on Twitter with anti-CRT messages, what they get is a frothy, a bit of frothy excitement on the top, but
but I don't think the support for these bills is very substantial at all or have as much depth. And I'm gonna say, um, this is definitely a complex issue, but if you're teaching, parents will push back. Other folks will push back. That's just a part of the profession. I feel like folks that are clear about what their goals are, their approach is in the classroom, that's a starting point. Beyond classroom matters though, I think pushing back against a large number of parents or others who are trying to change what's happening in your classroom, that you're committed to, things that you're committed to, you need allies. So you definitely need to find allies in your school district, find allies at the state level and stay informed. Um, it's hard work, teaching is challenging, but I feel like teachers also need to be in the mix when it comes to the things that will shape their daily life. So um, reach outside of that school and connect with allies, be involved with those spaces where folks are sort of making decisions about what will happen with teaching. Thank you. I really want to thank you all because you now helped me understand the email I just got from one of my kids' teachers about their plan to teach To Kill a Mockingbird. And frankly, I thought, why is she emailing me about this? Just teach the book. But now I, now I understand. I mean, I kind of knew, but I understand much better. So thank you. And I'm going to reach out to her and make sure she knows I support her. Um, we have another question that's a little bit um, complicated. So let me read it carefully to you all. Is there any sort of psychological guidance about when human cruelty can be, quote unquote, safely taught? to any certain age group or at any certain stage of development. I know we shouldn't be scared to talk to children about death because they're thinking about it, but unspeakable cruelty is hard to take for all of us. Some kids may not be able to handle it. Is this really a curriculum question? Hmm. Professor Rich, I see you nodding. It's, um... I spend a lot of time talking about this with um, graduate students that I work with that are teachers thinking about when and how do they introduce genocide, Holocaust genocide um, to students. And actually one of the grad students that I've been working with lately or, who has is in my program um, is an early childhood teacher. She teaches um, in a preschool and she's thinking not about teaching her students about um, gas chambers and mass murder, but at that level, starting um, with what has been called sort of a pre-Holocaust curriculum, the, the things that we talk about when we talk about um, character and inclusion. Um, but in this instance, really thinking about it as what is fair, right? What does fair mean? What do you do when a rule isn't fair, right? How do you, with kids, um, you know, K to five kids, it's all about fair and unfair. This this person had this and it was fair and I didn't and it was unfair. What happens if there's a rule made that that isn't fair, right? How do you think about standing up for, um, for your friends? And by the time you get to fifth grade, sixth grade into middle school, um, that's when we can start talking to kids about, and the research bears this out, I'm not, you know, sort of winging it, um, but that we can start talking to kids about more specific and far more cruel um, issues, though so you're not taking kids, um, you're not jumping to Auschwitz, you're starting with um, propaganda, hate speech, things like that, and looking at the steps, of course, that lead up to I know we're short on time. I will let somebody else. Want. Thank, thank you. That was that. Yeah, that was really insightful and, and thoughtful. Thank you. We have one last question that I'll turn to my other two panelists before wrapping up, um, and that is in the context of LGBTQ history, how might we as educators highlight this social discrimination without making learners scared of coming out? In other words, how might we teach accurate trends without forcing scared teens deeper into oppressive closets?
right? I feel like this is class. I can call on one of you. <laughs> <laughs> Laura, do you want to go first? I'll tr I'll say something. I mean, it seems to me. So I'm I'm one of the people that lots of my friends come to when they are scared teens coming out, um, and it actually seems to me like it's it's not that difficult at this particular moment to um, to tell kids that you know there are a lot of people you know who are queer and out and living happy lives and doing you know doing the kinds of work that they want and living in the kinds of families that they want to be in um so it seems to me that we could that things uh, maybe that just makes me old i'm like eh, things aren't that bad they've been a lot worse thanks professor rogers i'll give you the last word and i would say um in regards to this question i think what I would share is classroom climate definitely matters much. Creating a space where students are respected is really important. What that looks like, it takes some work. But I do think in the spaces that I'm in, I think students should have options to opt out, um, to not be in a position where they know the classroom context, they know what their classroom, their classmates are like, they need to have some options to sort of protect themselves from what sometimes, if you're one of few, which I've seen often, can be really harmful. So I think it's good to be thinking about how we protect students from um, what this person asking the question is trying to, is, is asking us about. Thank you. Well, I want to thank all of you for a really wonderful, insightful, um, and inspiring conversation. Um, judging from the questions, I think everyone in the audience enjoyed it as well. Um, I do want to take this final 60 seconds also to acknowledge all of the staff behind the scenes that nobody ever gets to see who handled all the technology. Um, and my colleagues from history, especially uh, Jess Johnson for keeping everything running, um, Alice Nash for managing the questions. And of course, my forever colleague, Julio Capo, for um, organizing this and bringing us all together. Um, this was really just a really beautiful event. And so I want to thank you all for your time and insights um, and generosity. Um, and with that, I think we can wrap up and say good night.